Ladies and gentlemen, join us today from Kansas, running for House District 23 Libertarian candidate Matt Clark. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. How you doing, brother? Very good. So, you, uh, you, you, you're. How old are you, Matt? I hate to start with this question, but That's I gotta right. ask. I'm 31. 31, because you. I mean, you, you got like the the. You're you're the first libertarian, uh, I've seen on this show without a beard in like in weeks, and it's well, it's like I. We we get this a lot as libertarians, don't we? Like, how come you don't? But you you've got the clean shaven, eager, young. You know, I just your your face on your website. Let's get this up here because I want to promote you. I want to make sure that you get the opportunity here. MattClarkKansas.com. You got the smiling face, clean shaven. You look at eager. And I I love this. There's a whole crop of libertarian candidates who are just like, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm not. I'm going to be myself and I'm not going to worry about it. And this is who I am and what I have to say. So Matt, tell us about this race. How did you decide to jump into this? Uh, criminal justice reforms are my real passion area. Um, I was pretty disgusted to see last year. Um, Kansas shipped over a hundred inmates to a private prison in Arizona. Uh, they were authorized up to 360 um, up to $17 million a year to ship inmates to Arizona because our prisons are at capacity, over capacity. Um, we have so many people locked up that just don't need to be. I mean, we were the last state, I believe, to end prohibition once it was ended federally. Um, and it looks like we're going to be the last state to quit locking people up for, for cannabis as well. Um, we... Uh, are just so behind on criminal justice reforms. The the stances that I have to take on my website um, just don't even feel like libertarian stances that I should have to take. Like these should have been things that we addressed 20, 30 years ago. Um, and then our taxes just keep going up. We're one of five states in the country uh, that still charge the full sales tax on groceries. Um, everyone else says, hey, food, you need food. We're not going to tax that at six and a half percent, but no, we're going to still tax it at six and a half percent with the money we already taxed on your income tax. So bringing criminal justice reforms to Kansas um, are, are my main driver. And while we're at it, we're going to lower some taxes as well. <laughs> nice. Now that, that's a huge motivator for libertarians, right? Because as a libertarian, you know, we're, we're motivated by ethics, morality, justice. And we see, you know, the war on drugs and the prosecution for uh, victimless crimes, you know, they, 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 these are like really offensive to us. Is this resonating with people in Kansas? Uh, it really is. Um, almost everyone I've talked to supports legalizing cannabis. Almost every single person I talk to has supported legalizing cannabis. I've been to about 1,700 doors so far in my district. Um, obviously I haven't talked to all 1700 people, but I've talked to a lot of people between me and my volunteers and almost everyone supports legalizing cannabis. You know, of course we as libertarians would love to end the drug war, but that is so far away in Kansas that I have not, uh, uh, even put that on my platform. I, I'm merely trying to reduce all other drug possession offenses to misdemeanors. And this year in Kansas, the 2020 session, that, hold on, hold on, hold on. That, that that seems like a very moderate step to just say across that like it I, I mean it's that's still a misdemeanor. Yeah. Like we're still like this is a huge compromise for you as a libertarian, right? To say we're just gonna make sure but uh, but I do want to point out that like in terms of policy impact, that would be pretty huge, right? Yes. Oh yeah, it was drastically reduced the prison sentences. And our prisons are rampant with these hard drugs anyway. So we're locking people up over their addiction problems. They're getting drugs in jail. Oh, and we haven't had visitors in our Kansas prisons for almost six months now. Guess what? People are still ODing on drugs. People are still getting in trouble for drugs. I wonder why that well, is. Well, hold on a second. I got. I got to like. I got to just unpack that for a second because what you just raised there is it, it, such a simple little quirk of current reality that 
touches on so many important stories. You're saying that jails in Kansas, jails and prisons, have not allowed visitors due to COVID for the last six months, right? Six months, well, since March or April, whenever. How many okay, months? yeah. Yeah, and still inmates are overdosing on drugs at the same rate as before? I don't know the rate because the Department of Corrections doesn't, it's difficult to get this information out, but this is from um, other sources, inmates, families, uh, groups where a non-entity is, is, is key to protect their, their, the people on the inside. So, um, but we are still getting reports of, of, uh, of drugs in prisons with no visitors. No, I just, I just love this because it, it, it reveals, like, this is really related to my personal experience. The first day I got the general population in the D.C. jail, I, I, I traded $5 worth of stamps for a joint because it was like, yeah, I got to smoke some weed in here. I got to, I got to, and you know, it's, what, what are the greatest ironies of of jail like the, people use drugs to cope with imperfections in their lives just putting it mildly right just as, as generally inclusively as possible there is nowhere that you want to do drugs more than when you're locked up there's nowhere more you need if you're stressed the relief of cannabis or the escape of alcohol or the calming effect of nicotine whatever it is for you and and i don't mean to praise drug use because i i think I'm, i would rather praise people having better lives and not depending on it but yeah it's it's who has access to smuggle stuff in a jail yep exactly the people who work there yep. yeah okay so if if you if, if we got every so this is the critical difference right most people who are going to jail on drug charges aren't going for misdemeanors, correct? They're going for felonies. Yeah, yeah. To the state prison system, most of them are there on felonies. All right. So, you know, Matt, another question I really want to ask all, you know, any candidate who comes on the show, because I think it's really important for understanding the texture of the coronaphobia crisis right now. You said you knocked on, was it 750 doors out of 1,700 in your district? No, no. I've been to about 1,700 doors out of uh, 10,000 doors. Okay. 1,700 out of 10,000 doors. That's awesome. And I want to point, by the way, I want to point this out for anybody who's watching. Like, that's the kind of candidate I want to support in the Libertarian Party. Because this is someone who's, who, like, really, if, if nothing else comes of this campaign, and it, it sounds like if you've got this kind of hustle and what you've chosen is, is a state house district, like, you have a, a shot of, of actually winning almost no matter what happens in something of this scale, that you can out-hustle the competition. And if, if you get to the other, you know, uh, 8,300 doors in the next couple months, that's going to be awesome. It's going to be an awesome experience for you and for all of the people who you are going to be able to touch with the message of freedom who had never heard it before. And that is so huge. And I, I just, I think that's a, a great example for anybody who's considering running for office as a libertarian. Like, you know, and, and I, I say this to, to there, there are a lot of people who, who are in our movement, you know, who are like reluctant to play the political side of things. And it's like, hey, do you want an excuse to go knock on 10,000 of your neighbor's doors and talk about what's most important to you without seeming creepy? Guess what? Put your name on a ballot. It's not creepy anymore. In fact, it's noble and legitimate and critical to advancing the American civic conversation now. But if you just go knock on doors and go, hey, man, have you heard of Rothbard? You know, uh, get out. No. Go. But what Matt is doing, connecting with people like that is, is really, um, you know, critical work for our movement. So, Matt, the question related to this is how has Corona affected your campaign? How are people like uh, interacting with you with masks or, or shaking hands and, and are people paranoid? How does that affect you uh, and your race? And you think the bigger uh, political scene right now? Yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting challenge for sure. I mean, I filed my paperwork for treasure, my treasurer back in January. So I planned on doing this long before Corona popped up. Um, so my initial 
plan to kind of get out there as, as the lockdowns are really in full force here in Kansas, um, or at least in my county. Um, you'd actually shared it on your personal page after visiting us uh, on a virtual uh, get together in April. Um, I strapped door hangers to the side of my car. I got yep. some, uh, signs on the side of my car with my campaign logo that I thought at one point I might use in parades or something, but that's, uh, that's all out the window. Um, so yeah, there's been some major adjustments. So I was driving around and just talking to people through my car. And having yeah, hold on, hold on, Matt, just for a second. For the sake of the video, I, I want to get that picture up. What's the easiest way for our producer to find the photo uh, of what you did with your vehicle? It would probably be on my Facebook campaign page um, from back in April. It would be one of the posts in April from my uh campaign page. So All right, well, CG can look for that while, while you go go back to your answer, please. Sounds good. But um, I've taken an approach um, I kind of thought was, was the best compromise because um, I want to still respect the people that are still afraid of COVID. Um, I, I don't want the mask to be the reason I don't get a vote. So I've been out door knocking. Um, my approach has just been to put the door hanger on the door first. Try to step six feet back. So I'm doing the six feet back if the porch allows it and wearing the mask and talking to people that way. And the reception has been, been really good. Um, the people that don't care about the masks, you know, no one's answering the door with the mask. But no one, uh, no one, if they don't want to wear a mask, they're not, uh, um, they don't care that I'm wearing a mask. Whereas other people open the door and say, I'm running for the to be your state representative. And they're like, you're wearing a mask. I'm going to vote for you. I'm like, okay, well, that was easy. Um, but here's the rest of my campaign priorities, if you'd like to take a look. <laughs> no, no, I just, I got, I, I just got to point out that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of sad that the celebrated default as the abundance of caution position is, is what you're doing. And it's, 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 the reality is that the general understanding of the virus in the American public right now is that. What you're doing there is being uh, just uh, cautiously, uh, abundantly polite, right? Yeah. And it's it's funny because it's actually counterproductive in so many ways. And you know, I I, I would I, I don't mind you tricking statists into voting for you accidentally by wearing a mask, like, and and I don't think any of your constituents in that category would be watching this right now. And if, but if they are, I want them to know why you're doing this. And 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 if if they want to vote for you because you're you're uh, you know abundantly cautious and polite, then hey, that's good. But that it's responsive to this faulty understanding about the practicality of the lockdowns and the distancing uh and it's really sad but i guess i guess this is an opportunity for every libertarian candidate right on lockdowns people are way more answer way more likely to answer the front door or in in the past you know the response rate for libertarians door knocking was was a much lower percentage than it is now but that's great so so matt for the people that are against the mask like i i mean i assume there are some or there, there are a bunch that are just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Uh, do, do you get addressed with that? Do people say, hey, man, you don't have to wear the mask for me? I think I've only had one person say that you don't have to wear the mask. But it's more work to take it off than it is to, you know, just leave it on. So, um, you know, I've had people want to shake my hands. And I'll shake their hands. That's fine. Um, uh, do some hand sanitizer before the next house. But, you know, it's just... I understand that it's people's sincere belief that that the mask is is protective of others so that if i'm wearing it i'm protecting them is that's their sincere belief so it's just out of respect for them yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's so many it's at the bottom line it's just a mask on my face it's it gets really sweaty and gross and it's not fun but we're shipping inmates out of state that's why i'm running and i don't want to get distracted by the COVID stuff by the mask stuff I want to bring real reforms to Kansas. And so I'll just put on the mask, mandated or not by the, by the state or by the county, um, and just go do it because that's their sincere beliefs and I'll just respect it and, and get to why I'm running. No, that makes a lot of sense, but I do want to challenge you on one thing you said there, Matt, that, yeah. that, that, that this is a distraction. And I get that it can be, right? And if you make the conversation all about that immediate physicality, what are we doing right now? Yeah, that's a distraction. 
But surely, I mean, you see $9 trillion in liquidity added to the U.S. dollar system. Uh, that's, that's not a distraction, except that the virus is a distraction from that, right? But all of these issues, these are still very real. Uh, you know, how for you as a state rep, does this affect both your campaign and, and policy you would propose? And I'm sorry, I got to add just one last preface to this question. You know, if, you, if you're if you going to take that position, it's just kind of a distraction. You think it's going to be over? Or are you optimistic about this? I'm not too optimistic. I, I don't think that uh, it's going to be over for a while, or at least the government responses aren't going to be open for a while. Um, so, yeah, obviously, man, the, the COVID battle has been fascinating in Kansas. We have a supermajority Republican legislature, a majority Republican Senate, and the Republicans put up such a horrific governor candidate in 2018 that we have a Democratic governor who's mm -hmm. been all about the lockdowns. Well, after she shut down schools, first governor in the nation to shut down schools, they basically stripped her power to issue statewide mandates. So she issued the statewide mandate for schools, which failed to pass the 10 member board of education. Then she passed the statewide mask mandate and, but it didn't have any teeth in it. It had to be enforced by the county health officials. And I think, what, 95, so like 90 to 95 out of the 104 counties in Kansas rejected to, declined to enforce her mandate. Uh, it's been, it's been a very epic power struggle. Um, mm. but I disagree with the Republicans a lot in Kansas, but in this case, with education and the mask mandate for um, some school restrictions and the mask mandate, they were all about localization, local control. That's what they were preaching up and down. I'm like, all right, here we go. I was thinking Adam Kokesh, right? <laughs> when, they're talk when they're saying that. Um, so localization has actually kind of won out with the COVID battle, the po co political COVID battle in Kansas, which has been uh, fascinating to watch. No, oh, thanks for pointing that out. It's another silver lining of the current crisis, right? Is that it sort of inherently drives local customization of policy. That's that's really cool. So, Matt, you're uh, you were an airline pilot before. Uh, what are you doing now? You said you're, you're on your website. You volunteer driving senior citizens for five years, although that's not a paid gig, I assume. Yeah. And uh, and and working with your church. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, well, I'm currently an airline pilot. Um, current employer just would like me to not mention who they are. Um, uh, wait, wait, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on. No, no. So, can can we? I uh, I've got to drill. Your 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 interesting self censorship here deserves to be examined. So you work you work for an airline company. Is it like a, one of the major brands we would recognize? It's a big airline you'd recognize. Yeah. Okay, and they they have requested that you not use the name of that airline just in your bio or in anything publicly connected to your politics? How do they say that? Yeah, that would be their, their preference. When I when I filled out the, the forms, conflict of interest forms and stuff like that, um, they've just had a lot of, uh, a lot of their pilots, uh, people trying to cancel them on social media. And it's a lot of work and they'd just rather not deal with that. And it's a, it's a good enough job. Um, well, it will be over the course of my career. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I can't. I, I can't fault you at all for for making this decision, right? In in, in light of these incentives and this basic threat of uh, losing your job, and obviously it's not as as hardcore as it could be, but they are. It, it is it is kind of shameful. And and is it the airline's fault, or are they just responding to the market forces? You know, I'm not going to pass judgment on 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 them either, but uh, it's oh man, it's really sad that that you know because Republicans and Democrat Democrats don't really have problems getting you know corporate endorsements in that sense. Like, oh yes, I I'm working with the CEO of this and this and this, and you can't even say I'm an employee of this major airline because that would that would be a nice thing. That's like when you say I'm a pilot. Like even even the wording on your website is a little confusing about this. And, and maybe you could maybe uh, maybe you should clear that up. I, but I'm able to um, 
I am likely to lose my job on October 1st. I'm likely to be furloughed for a couple of years due to the mass. Oh, oh um, man. So yeah. I freed up a little bit of my obligations to, uh, to speak about my employer. But I mean, the airline life is what's allowed me to, you know, I've been an airline pilot since what, I mean, 23, a year after college, I got hired as, as an airline pilot. And there's just so much time on the road, so much time to sit and read. And, uh, and so I just kind of went and down the path from, you know, a, a constitutional era class in college and just looking at the Constitution for the first time and being just like, how in the hell did we get from that to this? And so over the course of 10 years of just reading relentlessly, um, studying history as much as possible, that just led me down to the uh, down to the libertarian route. So. All right. So before we get to your other your other volunteering and church work, I gotta ask if you have any insights into the aviation industry in general right now with the COVID effect. It's completely decimated the aviation industry. Um, we saw an uptick in passengers in June and July, and it kind of seemed like, all right, here comes the recovery. But as that kind of new wave kind of swept through the southern states where it hadn't really been impacted by COVID before, uh, demand has dropped back off um, significantly. Um, so the only people really flying right now are people flying for family reasons, for uh, vacation reasons, because tickets are getting cheaper. Um, but there is no lucrative travel. There is no international travel. There is no business travel. I mean, there's some, but it is extremely limited. And so until businesses feel comfortable that they're not going to get sued if they send their employees somewhere and get COVID. So until businesses are comfortable sending their employees to travel again, um, and until the rest of the world starts allowing people from the U.S. to travel to their shores without 14-day, uh, 21-day lockdowns when you get there, um, we're, we're going to see a drastically smaller airline industry. So it's, uh, it's definitely rough out there. Uh, it's just it, it's just so sad to see another you know economic casualty. Uh, so anyway, tell us please about Jet Express and uh, and, and what you do with your church. Uh, Jet Express is a uh, for me a pilot, ironically named program um, through the uh, Jewish Community Center here in uh, uh, Overland Park, Kansas. And uh, I'd always volunteered high school, college. Uh, was heavily involved in Habitat for Humanity. Helped start some campus chapters and at my college and some area high schools in Omaha. Um, but once I started traveling for a living, I couldn't do that consistent volunteering on Saturday morning or Wednesdays or, or I, it was, I couldn't, I had a very inconsistent life. Um, so that's when I, I saw this on the, on the news one day, they needed drivers and it's, it's just a great program. They just have one or two coordinators who take calls from senior citizens. They need a ride to the doctor's office, to the grocery store, to, uh, the hair salon and, uh, they just take the information, put it in an online database, and you just go in and pick up whatever ride works with your schedule. Driving in your personal vehicle, they get some social social interaction with you, and uh, and get to where they need to go um, for uh, very cheap. I think they cover they charge like four or five dollars a ride to help cover some of their over, overhead costs, but um, it's far cheaper than than uh, about any other options out there. Nice. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. The website is mattclarkkansas.com. Uh, I'm excited about your race. I'm excited that we have a, a gold wave in 2020 of candidates like you working locally, knocking on doors, connecting with people the way that you are. Matt, uh, aside from your website, mattclarkkansas.com, is there anything else people should know about you or how to connect with you? Uh, feel free to reach out to me via my website. Otherwise, uh, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, Matt Clark KS is the uh, is the link. Um, that's my main one. I have Instagram as well. I'm not too active on there. But if you want to join me on Facebook, especially and help break those algorithms, so that uh, more than 20 people can see my posts at a time, I would greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much.